Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure as an ESPA member to introduce this ne next session. And my name is Joey Nickel, and I'm from the great state of New Hampshire. But the person that I'm going to introduce needs no introduction, so I'm not going to spend time doing that because she wants all the time to spend talking about the applying the science of reading. So I introduce to you Katie Garner. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's true, I asked her if I could have every single minute of time, so thank you. <laughs> that was a clever way to make sure I got all that time. Now, am I a little too, can everybody hear me okay? Do I sound too loud, too soft? Okay, I feel like I have a big mouth, so I might get louder, and if I do, just do this, and then they'll turn me down. <laughs> now, what I want to do is kind of go over some housekeeping stuff first, and then jump right into um, everything that we're gonna hit today. Raise your hand if you've been to a session that I've done here before. Like not here in Portland, but at this conference or even at another conference. Okay, so there's some folks that have been here. I almost never do, um, well I never do the same thing twice, but I try to move in a, in a consistent direction. So what we're gonna really look at today is what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what makes sense or doesn't. Um, and then look at a parallel track that we can take that's gonna seem um, very non-traditional and yet make perfect sense. Um, all aligned with what we're trying to get to, which is the science of reading um, effect. Taking all of this phonics knowledge that many of your states, depending on where you are, many states have had teachers um, start the training for science of reading, and you're really being inundated with a lot of information, and this information may or may not feel comfortable yet for you. But at the end of the day, we have to activate that knowledge to get it to our end user, who could be five, and eating his shoe and licking the carpet while you're making that delivery. So you understanding everything is step one, but the real um, test is can you get it into the head of the kid who actually need, needs to use it? And their purpose for using it is to figure out that word, to write this word, to get them reading not to become phonics masters, not to become little mini speech pathologists, but to get them reading. That's the goal of the game, to get kids reading. From there, um, all kinds of great things happen once we get them reading. So we're gonna look at this uh, from a different perspective, but first what I wanna do is show you where you can go to finish the conversation. Because inevitably, when we get to the end, I will still have some, some things, kind of balls in the air that we're gonna wanna play with and toss a bit. Um, and kind of flesh out. So this is a Facebook group. There's about 136,000 folks in there from around the country, um, all at different levels with science of reading application, um, understanding, use, even non-use. Some states haven't really um, kind of pulled into this yet. And keep in mind, when I say science of reading, I don't, uh, it's, not, it's not a laser focus to me. It's not just science of reading, it's science of learning. It's not just about how the brain learns to read, it's about how the brain actually learns. And you're gonna see that as a resonating theme today because that sometimes becomes the redheaded stepchild of the science of reading movement, is how the brain actually learns. And by the brain, I mean common denominator brain starting at the five-year-old who's eating his shoe. You know, going all the way up to our brain, which is sometimes feeling not, like, not much better than that. You know, we're older, we've been doing things the way we've been doing them, and now we're trying to learn all these new tricks. Um, and everything in between. Everybody in between that has to kind of take in this information. But keeping an idea, or keeping, keeping, um, keeping pace with what we understand about how the brain actually learns, and then pulling these ideas that we're learning through this science of reading base into that is a, is a key, it's a, it's a key, um, Nexus. So you're going to see that kind of coming on throughout this, throughout this presentation. That is a scan code you can use if you don't know um, how to find the group in the Facebook group. There's two Facebook places that you'll end up if you type in science of reading and science of learning. So this is just going to make sure you get to the right one, which is the interactive group. And there is also um, a download that I'm going to show you how to access as well. So let me skip ahead here. If you go to either the site for the conference or, and just click on our session, or if you wanna find this ongoing past the time of the conference, if you go to either katiegarner.com or secretstories.com, 
Um, look at the drop down menu and you will find the session handout packet always accessible under the conference tab. It's a big packet with clickable links that let you dive into um, kind of a take a deeper dive down the rabbit hole into different topics that we're going to be talking about. It also lets you print out things that I show um, or watch a video to recap something that you want to just see one more time before you jump in and do that strategy with a group or with a student. So this is a really kind of a powerful packet. It's updated probably every other month or so. Um, so you can always check back and download it again or look for any changes. And then you're welcome to share pieces of it if you need to when you go back to your school and share what you've learned here. Uh, there's also some research, uh, some, some studies that were done. And uh, Rachel Schechter, who directed um, and I guess verified, she'll talk more about what she did specifically. Um, but uh, these studies are posted, and you can look at these and just kind of see through these different lenses of grade level use, geographical locations, applying these strategies. And this is really um, a strategy-focused session. So we're not talking about a program. We're talking about what we need to do to make sense of our program, whatever the program may be. Because we're all using different programs, reading programs, phonics programs, whatever you're using. But there's a lens through which you want to feed that information to make sure that you can go further, faster, and earlier with the code, and that it can make sense to you and to your students. So this was the kind of the thrust of, this, of these studies that were done, and Rachel's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, OK, and I've got to remember that I'm not clicking in a particular direction. One thing I want to demonstrate um, first, before we go into what we're really going to hit, is this thing called the better alphabet. I'm going to back up for one second. Do you see that clickable arrow? That's an example of what you'll see throughout the packet. But I'm going to use one example of what I think is one of the most important clickable arrows for you to access in the packet if you teach primary. So raise your hand if you are a K or a, or a pre-K, K, or first grade teacher. OK, and if, and if you're not, if you're high school, that's fine too, because what we're going to be talking about stretches all the way up to anybody who's cracking the code. But if you're a primary teacher or if you teach ELL, then this is one of the most important clickable arrows that you're going to see in your pack. So I want to actually show you um, what's there and why it's important. And I'm also going to ask, usually there is like a little um, glass of water that's up here. Do you know if, sorry to ask, I was going to ask, do you know if there's a bottle of water that I could, thank you so much. Um, okay. The better alphabet is a way to fast track all of the individual letter sounds in two weeks to two months. And this is imperative because you can't do anything with them by themselves. So if you teach kindergarten right now, you could, and probably do, spend your entire year working on individual letters and sounds. And you can't, you do, we don't have that time. We have to be actively applying these skills for the purpose of reading. Because remember, the goal of the game is get them reading, get them reading. And I don't mean to do that in a pushing way. I mean to do that in a logical way, because that's what we're doing all day long. We're looking at words all day. And we don't want to just look at them. We want to do something with them. We want to make sense of them. And if all you have are individual letters and sounds, it's not possible to do. You need the sounds letters also make when they come together, which means we need a, a, a simultaneous access track. We need more, sooner, faster. Speed is important. There's a need for speed when it comes to the code. It's like a puzzle. The more pieces we have, the easier it is to see how it comes together. The less pieces we have, the harder it is. So it all starts right here. And the alphabet sounds can be very tough to teach to kids who would rather eat their shoe. It is very difficult to get kids to focus on abstract symbols and sounds that serve no purpose as far as they can see. So this is step one of cheating the brain. And this is where we get into the neuroscience to deliver things faster. Uh, there is no faster way to acquire individual letters and sounds than through muscle memory. It is the absolute fastest way. It is not reliant on cognitive readiness uh, or um, skill knowledge or even language in terms of language deficits with our ELL learners or auditory processing issues with our speech and pathology kids. None of those things come into play when we're tackling this through muscle memory. Now, to activate the muscle memory, we're going to use a melodic mnemonic. And that melodic mnemonic is called the better alphabet. It's not a song, even though it's called the better alphabet song. 
it's, a, it's more like 26 mini songs, and I'll tell you why. If you've ever sung a song that you know you could sing in your sleep, don't even know you're singing it until your friend hits you and tells you to stop, there's no conscious effort to pull the sounds or the words. You're, it's just rolling off your lips, tongue, and teeth. The problem with that is it's autopilot. Your brain's not thinking. Your brain's not even in the game. And you can't come up with a particular word in a particular verse unless you start at the very beginning and sing it all the way through. So that's not going to help. It's great that it's that easily put into our system, but it's not helpful if we can't manipulate it. So you can cheat. And this is where it's fun to understand the brain science, because it's like understanding your chess opponent and then making moves based on where they are going. So if you know that the brain's going to lock all this together as a read-only disc, this pitch, rhythm, and intonation that is going to be our melodic mnemonic, all we have to do is split it at the parts that kids need to be able to pull. So you're going to see this demonstrated. I'm going to play this clip. This is of a pre-K class. It's only 15 seconds. It was shared on Instagram. Although you are going to see both sounds of C, which is interesting, because when I say that it knocks out those individual letters and sounds in two weeks to two months, I mean every possible sound a letter can make by itself. Hard and soft C, hard and soft G, three sounds of Y, long and short sounds for vowels, everything. It gets into the nooks and crannies of anything a letter can do by itself. So not phonics, just individual letters. And in the most likely order. So I'm going to play it. What I want you to watch is that there's, when you see her singing, or this group singing, there's no conscious retrieval that's cognitive. They're not trying to remember the sound that the letter makes. It's just rolling off their lips, tongue, and teeth. There's only one thing you really do have to put conscious effort toward, and that's making sure that they see the symbol when they say the sound. Because if you let them just sing this, they will have all the sounds of all the letters, but have no idea what any of them look like, which means it's of no use for actual reading and writing. So they do have to have their eyes glued to the letters when they're singing the sounds. Um, in that Facebook group, I mentioned there are some, there's a free download file, like files in this free download file cabinet. And some of the things go toward um, this, what we call muscle mouth and eye glue, just to make sure kids are seeing what they sing and singing what they see. Because what we want to do is map that sound symbol connection in the brain. So those two things have to happen simultaneously. Now you'll see in this video, one of the kids is very upset that they're not looking at the letters as they're singing the sounds, which tells me the teacher's done a great job training them, because she's going like this, trying to get the kids to refocus on the letter. Um, so that just tells me that on a typical day, they're doing this exactly right. A, B, C, 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 but it can also say. Now that was hard and soft C, but notice that they're just rolling through it. They're not trying to use cognitive retrieval. It's coming through this different backdoor pathway that we're triggering through a melodic mnemonic, which is actually a very specific recipe. Not any song will do. And again, you have to break up the parts that you want to be retrieved by repeating the pitch rhythm and intonation over again at that, at that point. So that basically, it's like 26 mini songs you can start right on the letter you need. And what's really interesting when you look at melodic mnemonics is the use, what it's for, to control the next utterance of sound. And it's typically related to those that have um, verbal problems, problems stringing words together related to medical um, need, aphasia, Parkinson's, um, even, even Alzheimer's, but we can control the next utterance of sound by putting in what comes before it. And then we apply a repetitive pitch rhythm and intonation to it, and it just kind of takes on uh, a momentum of its own. And it is the fastest way for our learners who also have deficits cognitively, not necessarily deficits, but underdeveloped areas. The brain development is not reliable at these early ages. Kids are all over the map in terms of what they're ready to do, what they're ready to even try to do. So we want to sneak through that back door and capture them all. We're going to look at early brain development back to front. We're going to see where our ends are versus where our blockades lie. And we want to always go through those ends. We never want to have to, to try to squeeze through a door that's this big if we could just walk straight through you know, a wide open space. Now, this is going to show you how this applies, because ultimately, as we slip these skills in through the back door, they do have to transfer to the higher level processing centers for use. So when a child's actually ready to put these to use, they do have to take this information that we've kind of front-loaded or back-loaded, I guess you'd call it since we're going this way, and they have to pull from it to put it to practice. 
So while we can get it in easy peasy, it's, it's going to look different in terms of when kids actually start putting it into play. We can acquire all the letters and sounds, but what kids do with it is going to be student to student dependent. So this little girl is doing a letter sound assessment. One of the person who posted this, I don't even know who they are. I wish I did as I use this slide. I love it to show what I try to say um, better. Um, she wrote, and this was posted in Facebook group too. She wrote, in September this week, kindergartner was still four and wasn't able to give me any letters or sounds. We sang the better alphabet song every day, and you actually have to sing it twice a day. Um, and I would even hear kids singing it on their, way when they, on their way home or on their own when they were partnering. Fast forward to the first week of November, watch what she can do. Can you hear her beautiful dialect? There's a second language spoken at home. Now, this is just a letter sound assessment. The teacher's pointing to the letter, and the student has to sing the letter and the sound, and it's all out of order, so you can just see the ease with which this is pulled. What I want you to notice, and this is just a, something interesting from a neural perspective, there's no break between the letter name and the sound. Now, whatever grade level you teach, this is just a fascinating thing to see when you when you're aware that depending on how you take this information in, you can apply different learning systems to hold it in place. If this were learned information, she would have to pause for a minute while she retrieves what she needs, which in this case would be the letter name, like most kids might say, uh, E says, uh, eh. Like they'd have to think for a minute. There'd be a little stopping point. You'd even see their eyes go up and to the right if you were there. With her recall, there's absolutely no pause whatsoever because they're inextricably linked in the brain. They're just pulled together. The sound and the symbol are one, and it's actually the letter name that prompts the sound to come out. So it's non-conscious retrieval, which is fascinating. How about this one? Hey, says. She says a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a why says oh, 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 oh. but you can also say e e r i r e yes now what's really interesting is she didn't know why right off the top of her head the teacher jumped in and started singing yeah 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 but then she went on to say but it can also say e or i or e or i or e now that is the different sounds of Y based, you know, when Y is at the end of a word, it has, it can say you at the beginning of the word and at the end of the word, it can make the E sound or the I sound. There are a lot of complicated phonics rules that kids learn across those grade levels, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. Positional sounds of Y is one of the latest skills taught. It's taught toward the end of second grade. She doesn't understand and comprehend all of the different aspects of the positional sound of Y phonics skill. But off the tip of her tongue, this is what she's got in her arsenal to try to attack the letter Y. But she's not going to just randomly throw out those sounds. She knows Y is sneaky. Now, we'll talk about him a little bit later. But she knows that his behavior aligns a lot with the behavior of kids who are the caboose in line, who tend to act up in line when they're the caboose. Because when you're the caboose, you're less likely to be caught or seen. So kids that are at the back of the line tend to need a little more um, supervision than kids who are the line leader. When you're the line leader, you're perfect. You do exactly what you should. <laughs> just like why he always behaves when he's the line leader. When he's at the beginning of a word, he does just what he should. Yeah, 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 well, yes, you yak. It's only when he's at the end. Or in the middle, hidden between other letters where he doesn't think he can be seen, that he's more likely to be sneaky. So she understands the dynamics of how to navigate what sound he's most likely going to make based on knowing about his behavior. Just like she could tell you or tell the sub, she can't be at the end of the line because she'll hit people, because she'll hit, she always hits people. She has to walk with you. Now, every kid in the class can tell the sub way more than they ever wanted to know about the behavior of the kids in the class. So when we align kid behavior with letter behavior, we make the sounds more easily predictable. We bring it into a realm that is behaviorally and emotionally connected, and it's an earlier area of brain development, these social and emotional feeling-based connections. It's not the same as the higher level processing executive functioning center. 
because that's based on a base of knowledge and factual information that has to be accumulated over time in order to be efficient. And we've got a lot of kids who don't have that base of knowledge. Either they skipped around a little bit, they didn't pick up things when they should have, they weren't developmentally ready for skills when they were taught, maybe English isn't their first language. So we're looking for kind of our, our common denominator. What does everybody have to pull from that makes sense to them? And when we get into these feeling-based behaviors, that's it. So I'm a little bit ahead of myself, I don't wanna get too far ahead, but the reason I wanna plant this seed is this goes toward the simultaneous access that we're gonna look at. Because kids need those individual letter sounds, but they need them knocked out fast so they can get to the other stuff that also is paramount, which are the sounds letters make when they come together and can make it appear that letters aren't doing what they should. You know, like we tell kids, T says turtle, t -t -t -t, and then it never does. And it never does, because it's always in words like this, they, them, those, the. So to a kid who only knows this much, it looks like that's the norm and this is the exception. So having simultaneous access lets them think about letters like they do kids, like, oh, we're not supposed to eat snack now, but she gets to because she goes to the nurse and she has to eat a snack or she will fall asleep. Like, we, we think in terms of patterning, if not, then this, if not, then this, but the information's easier when it lives together, not when it seems like things are just totally contradictory. Then our brain doesn't quite know which side to pick as the, as the norm or as the pattern. So this goes to show, this is just something that shows how you take it out of the realm of abstract letter sounds, pull it into a place where something is actually meaningful for kids. And this little guy found this song so meaningful, he wrote the lyrics. And he did a really good job, actually, if you look at this, because here it says, actually, I couldn't believe how <laughs> intent he was on doing this. He says, A says, ah, 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 ah. He's got exactly the right number of A's for the sound in the song but it can also say a, 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 a. Now, he spelled a the way he knows to denote the a sound, which is, and I know you guys are too young to know who Fonzie is, right? This is like a whole lesson in itself. But Fonzie is just too cool, so he always sticks up his th thumbs, and if you're old like me, can you tell me the sound he makes? A, yeah, so that's how he spelled, or why he spelled the a sound, a, e, y, a, y, and he picked a, y. But he couldn't spell the word also, but that's okay. And he says, B says, B, B, B. Now, obviously, he got distracted here <laughs> because now he says, C says, K, 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 But it can also say, and what I thought was really interesting is he clearly forgot about the but it can also say soft C sound. So he went into D, and then he came back and squeezed it in because he didn't want to leave it out. So he put it in that space. He continues on all the way until he runs out of space, and then he ends the alphabet right there because there's no more space to write it. So. It's neurobiologic, and this is not my quote, this is a quote by Mary Helen and Mordino Yang, it's neurobiologically impossible for kids to think deeply about things they don't care about. Why would they care about squiggles and sticks that make sounds for words that they can't read and don't even know what reading is? They don't know what reading is, they don't know what writing is, they don't know what these things are for. Why should they stop eating their shoe? I wouldn't, like, I don't even have a goal to my game here. I won't even have enough of all this stuff to read with until the end of second grade or maybe first grade if I can learn some words. But I need so much of the code in order to make it come together to, to make sense. Thank you, I'm so sorry to make you walk a mile. Thank you so much. Um, so getting this kind of transfer of need to know and, um, and caring about it is what really pulls kids in and deepens ownership. So there's just a wide gap between what we know about the brain and how we teach kids to read. Even with the science of reading, there's a wide gap between what we know about the brain and how we teach kids to read. Starting with the fact that we go way too slow. And I don't mean push kids, make them, you're gonna see what we're gonna do is a thousand times easier than what you do going slow. Because when you go fast, what is really fast? Is fast how well you can tattle? Like how many of your kids, and you can raise your hand and tell me this, how many of your kids know how to tattle? Can you raise your hand if you have kids who are capable of tattling at whatever grade level you are? Okay, that's really good. So if they could tattle, would they be able to tell you who just stuck their tongue out at someone? That's as simple as tracking back to a digraph that's taught in first grade. These letters are never supposed to sit together, ever. Just like you two are not supposed to sit together because the way that you two are talking right now, well, these guys don't talk, but what they do is something even worse. Anytime they sit together, they stick out their tongues and they go and that's the sound they make, which is why they're split up, they're never to be together, but they listen as well as the two of you, because <laughs> every time you turn around, guess who's there? 
Look at any page, any line of any book, of any page, do this, put your finger down and you'll find them in that line because they are everywhere. And they're always sticking their tongues out and they always go. Now, if kids can access that sound, then why would we wait to give it to them when this is in every single sentence? Like, they need it now. They need it now. Speed is so key when it comes to the code, and it's so easy to give if you just bring things back to these areas that are developed and ready to take them instead of kind of traipsing through this, this three to four grade level year progression. Now, I'm not saying your phonics scope and sequence isn't critical. It is imperative that you have a phonic scope and sequence. You have to have a logical, sequential, structured order of expectation to know who is doing what when, how is it supposed to look, when is it supposed to happen, how is it going to be done. That is critical. But those shouldn't be shackles that keep you from making sense on a regular basis. You have to make sense. You ha that's what teachers do. We put meaning where there would otherwise be none. So kids can go, oh, I get it. And then they can do whatever it is they're doing in the moment, like reading the word the, e, the. And don't worry about voice and unvoiced. That's a whole nother thing that I can't get into today, but there's a video on that, and you'll see a clickable link for it in your download. Um, because there's, again, it's, it's really easy to lose sight of the ball and go off on a tangent when the goal of the game is get him reading. Get him reading. Did he get the word? Good. Go. Move. Get him reading. It's not about all the superfluous stuff that sometimes is coming into play, and it's blocking our path to getting him reading. Um, the rich get richer, the poor get richer. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the Matthews effect takes hold with reading achievement. So the, the faster we can get kids reading, the more opportunity they have to practice these skills. The more they practice these skills, the more they own them. The earlier they start, the deeper the ownership is. And the more advanced they are by the time they get into those grade levels where they're not learning to read, they have to read to learn. And we got a lot of kids stuck on the hump trying to do both at the same time. And that doesn't work, because then you have a, dra a drop in everything that is comprehension, which is the goal of the game as kids move on and reading becomes their pathway to knowledge. Um, raise your hand if you have kids who have ever played rough outside and gotten hurt. Raise your hand if you think your kids would know what to say if they got hurt. What do you think they would say if they got hurt? <laughs> Ow! And that is a second grade um, diphthong, vowel combination. But Howard needs it now. Howard needs the ow and he needs it now, because otherwise his name is Ha'awa Arada. He needs O-W and he needs the A-R, and he needs it right now, or he has to write a random sequence of letters that he does not hear in his name every day. And he has no idea why he's writing these letters, because his name isn't Ha'awa Arada, it's Howard. How confusing that disconnect is for poor Howard. And it's not just Howard that needs the ow now, every kid who has to read and write the word now, or about, or flower, or cow, every kid, every kindergartner has to read the word now, or how. But I, it's ironic we say they have to read it, because they're not going to get the code they need to read it. They're just going to have to know it, which means they're going to have to memorize it. And yet it's as easy as just plopping something out that makes immediate sense and using the heck out of it every chance you get. Now, this ow sound is not always ow. We have words like glow, slow, flow, blow. And that is why this next most likely patterning aspect of the brain has to be fed, which is what's the next most likely thing when ow doesn't work. Well, do you see superhero O flying overhead? He's their all-time favorite superhero ever. And whenever he flies by, they'll stop dead in their tracks and go, oh, 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 because they love him. But that's the sound they can make, too. So flow, glow, slow, blow. If they're not saying ow, there's your next most likely thing to try. And what holds all this together are embedded mnemonics. And the research on embedded mnemonics is clear. The problem was that the thought of what to do with embedded mnemonics stopped at a place where it fell off a cliff, meaning embedded mnemonics, which are just the, vi the, the images are embedded into the actual phonics skills. So instead of having like a, um, a house, or even worse, like a girl for E-R-I-R-U-R, -R -R, and that's on your, let's say, phonics wall or your sound wall, or a mouth that's going with your E-R-R, -R, whatever that might be. <laughs> um, that's a whole other thing, too. There's a video on that as well. Um, but instead of having those cues, just take the girl cue for a quick second. How do we spell girl? It's I-R. So once a kid actually gets a, a leg up on, oh, I get it, the er sound is in the word girl. But the problem is the E-R isn't, the U-R isn't, so why is it a girl? Shouldn't we also have to have a picture of a curl and then also a picture of a, of dirt? Like, or no, that would be girl. Of her? Like, it doesn't, 
there's no logical way to do it. It's not clean. So what's clean is you literally just take the sound and embed in it whatever it is that's going to denote it. So in this case, ah! raise your hand if you've seen kids at three play cars and make that sound, whether they're playing on the rug or sliding across the floor. So you, sh you look at something and the sound becomes obvious. That's an embedded mnemonic. Now, when I mentioned it fell off a cliff and kind of didn't work, that's because if you use embedded mnemonics to teach individual letter sounds, and you go in that direction where you're going to cognitively remember all the individual sounds, so you've got Apple, Annie, and then you've got Bobby the banana, and you've got, I don't know, uh, Caddy the cat, the problem is all those characters or embedded mnemonics come together to make phonic sounds, and things become highly irrational, illogical, and multiply by, by the tens and the twenties. So now you have way too many connections and there's no logic inherent in them. So embedded mnemonics typically you will only see for individual letter sounds, which is kind of a shame because they're putting the heavy lifting where it actually isn't, it's so easy to just get those through muscle memory. The heavy lifting, the real crux of the game here are these phonics patterns. That's where we need our big guns and that would be this embedded mnemonic aspect of what we know research says works. Now, keeping it in place, like doing, the, I talked about heavy lifting, that's the point of the visual. What kids can't do is keep track of which ones do what. They can't remember which ones stick out their tongues, which ones play rough, I don't remember who drives in the car, so they don't have to. As long as the embedded mnemonic connects the dots for them, all they have to do is have access to seeing that visual. So you'll be able to download the ones I'm holding up so you can see what I'm talking about with your kids in terms of immediate use, even if they don't know what a T or an H is separately. Let's say they don't, because if it's kindergarten, better alphabet takes two weeks to two months to take hold, which means during that time, they may not know what a T does or an H does by itself. But guess what they'll walk out the door with the minute you tell them? The TH. As Soon as they see it, and I don't know if you guys can see it in the back, but you saw it earlier, it's, oh, it's right there. Those tongues sticking out, immediately upon seeing that, you could point to it and your kids could go. So that's something we can't get with muscle memory. Muscle memory, the easy stuff, actually takes longer because it takes two weeks to two months. When you go back to what kids already know, you're not really teaching something. You're just revisiting something that's already there. And now you're tying it to something that's new and that otherwise would be meaningless. Now, when we look at things like Letter of the Week, there's a program, I was working with a school district and they were using, um, it's, a gr it's a good program as, move, as it moves through the grades, but in kindergarten, actually there are a couple different districts using a couple different programs that were doing this. All kindergarten gets are individual sounds, that's it. Absolutely no phonic skills whatsoever, which is why they have to memorize 300 sight words. Because the, le the less phonic skills you have, the more sight words you have to memorize. You have to read something, right? How do I read the word her if I think it's her era? I got to know the er sound, that's our controlled vowels, that's not taught till end of first, beginning of second. So what do I do in the meantime? Well, I'm going to memorize that, it's one of my sight words. That's what we can't have. That's where your scope and sequence becomes your handcuffs. Your scope and sequence should be your safety net. It's your, it's your navigational compass. It's the place that directs you to where you need to be. If all else fails, you have to at least make sure this is covered. And what it also does is it gives you a focus for your structured practice because the structured practice is gonna in incorporate much more than just a connection to make sense of a word you're looking at. You're gonna get fine motor skill practice. You're gonna get opportunities to apply it and use it in words. It's a small block, maybe 20, 30 minutes, but it's, it's a focused, targeted laser beam application. The beauty of making things make sense is it's not 20 or 30 minutes, it's all day. When something makes sense, you can't unsee it. So now every time I see the er uh, in a word, I'm gonna be applying it to figure out that word. So my reading block has now just shifted into a 24-hour time frame. Like, there's never time where I will see text and not see familiar faces in it and try to figure them out. So that's where you really get this practice that you could never replicate with program instruction because you're, you're making sense of something and text is everywhere. So the world's your oyster to practice it, to play with it, to use it, to do it. If you're doing a letter of the week, though, the world is not your oyster. As a matter of fact, even the word flower would be quite a problem because it's full of awa er. So it's going to be many a year of phonics instruction before the word flower will make sense, and yet the poor teacher is stuck with words like this coming at her all the time, and she's constantly having to say, it just is, it just does, you just have to remember. And of course, we know that's not possible, because how could you remember that much? So we end up, it's like a kid with no glasses sitting in your classroom staring at a board, and he can't make sense of any of the words. 
He's there. His eyes are in the right direction, but wouldn't it be nice to put some glasses on him and let him see things that actually make sense? Like, that's the, that's the difference there. It's not one more thing. It's, it's not even something you're doing. It's something you're using to, to do what you're doing. So now when you see a word like flower, fl ow, er, like you have a way to make connections, to make sense. That's the goal. And structured doesn't have to mean slow. Structured, focused, laser beam practice is a key piece for kids to really see and understand how things come together and apply. But it doesn't mean that that's as far as you can go and that's all you can say and that's the only thing that you can share. Because the words that your kids are having to use and read and write and see, all of those words, the program cannot keep pace with if you're at an early grade level. If you're at an upper grade level, by the way, the blocks don't change. The code doesn't change, just the text level to which it's applied. You're just building skyscrapers, but with the same blocks. And you'll see as we look at some really heavy duty texts that have the same building blocks as the lower level text. Now this is um, something that I am gonna play, it's about four minutes. But imagine that you have 10 letters, five sight words, and a picture of your favorite animal. What could you do with those 10 letters and five sight words to tell me what your animal is and why you like it so much? Could you do anything with those 10 letters and five sight words? We're gonna find out. If you're in an upper grade, it may not be 10 letters and five sight words, but it's whatever you have in your arsenal of code cracking skills, and yet you're supposed to be writing about, I don't know, the industrial revolution and you're seeing kids say things are really cool and really fun and really big and it's so, so, so cool and you're wondering, why isn't he talking about things that I know he knows? Maybe he can't build those words because he doesn't have all those sounds in those words and those words aren't part of his controlled memory. So same problem, just from a different level. And you'll see what these teachers, these are teachers from around the country in different professional developments and you'll kind of get to see the inner thinking of kids as seen through our eyes. What's the first grade word? <laughs> okay, the next part. Now, does everybody have their five side words? Yeah. Yes. Now, outside of your brain, draw a picture of your favorite animal, but it has to be a group group decision as to what your favorite animal is. So you've got your five side words, you've got your ten letters. They're inside of your brain, so that's the stuff you know, which is a lot, so congratulations, because in pre-day or kinder, you're at the head of the pack, that's under your belt already. You've got a picture of an animal that you love the most, that you're so excited about, so now what you're gonna do is using only those 10 letters and five sight words, you're gonna tell me what your animal is, and why you like it so much. Oh. <laughs> Spell rat easier? Yes, I saw rat. <laughs> I just like the way your face looks right now as your as your your eyes are rolling all over your your like so you're gonna see something that's not already there the 18th time they roll over those letters. <laughs> this spot rum to me. He brings rum to you. Wow. <laughs> Got him well trained. <laughs> Is that a college trick he picked up? It's right. <laughs> Is that what he keeps in that little? <laughs> now, I love that. What would go at the very end of that? A period. A period. Very good. And then I'm going to ask you to uh, tell me what Spot is. Can you tell me what kind of an animal he is? I'm not using newsletters. <laughs> you mean you don't know how to write? Well, well, tell me first of all, what is he? A dog. A dog. So do you know how to spell the word dog? Like, And keep in mind, that's what you know. Nope. Nope, you don't. Can you try? Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How? B-O-V. 
B oh, oh, that's very good actually, because that's really close. Because it, I got the ah sound that I need. It's just the d d d sound. Do you remember that letter that makes that sound? It's so tricky, and I know it's not in your brain. D d that would be a D. That would be the first one. So if you put a D O, and we'll talk about the letter that you need at the end in just a bit. Me like the dog. Me like the dog. That works. That's creative. Yeah, that's a good way to get around that. Is it because you don't have an eye? Yeah, we don't have an eye. But me likes dog. That would be a good option. And why do you like the dog? Because you also have to tell me why you like the dog. The dog is dead. <laughs> Have letters to make you do have letters to make dead okay that would work i guess that would be sad and i'll refer you to the counselor but i guess you could do that you said me like the dog the dog is dead that you see right there she had the world's worst letters possible and she couldn't write she had I don't know what animal she had a pig or something she had none of the letters that were in the actual word that she needed to write so she did what kids do when they don't know what to write she just sat there and stared at her paper so me coming up to her and saying well that's okay just sound it out like with what <laughs> what does she sound it out with she doesn't have a P and I or a G how she's supposed to try to get the word pig on the paper or I might say something like well just do your best with what? You can't read or write with nothing. Like, how do you do that? It's not possible. Now, kids don't know enough to say, how would you propose I do that? She, on the other hand, looked like she just wanted to smack me when I, and I was kidding her, but I was trying to kind of do that on purpose to show, like, see how in, insane it is for us to tell kids to do something with nothing and then expect them to actually do it. Like, but, but at the same time, we don't have a choice because we do have to start reading and writing in kindergarten, of course we do. We can't wait until they're done with the code in second grade. So we have to put the cart before the horse, but yet when we do that, we have to be mindful that we did that. And because we did that, we have to try to untangle ourselves. Like, it's not okay to just be like, well, yeah, I'm asking them to do something they can't do, but you know what? That's the way of the world. <laughs> like, yeah, we're asking them to do something they can't do, so what can we do to make it something they can do? And teaching them 4,000 phonics skills is not the answer but connecting these sound skills to things they already know, so they have immediate access to do it right now in science, right now in math, right now in social studies, that's where things start to get back on track. Now things become logical and linear, everything's actually coming together in a way that makes sense. Your structured practice, your scope and sequence, that's just gonna help you hone in and target and chip away at fine tuning and polishing something they've been doing maybe for months, maybe for years. But that's not a problem, that's a great thing. When you're trying to just focus in on something that your kids look at as old hat, there's no teacher in the world that would have to take, take issue with that. That's wonderful. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a sin or a crime to advance past your scope and sequence if you do it without being skill focused, meaning you're not teaching skills, you're connecting information. You're connecting something abstract that happens to be a phonic skill, but you're connecting it to something that's already deeply understood and entrenched in the kid's network of, of, of um, understanding and experience. So the one thing I want to say about this actually before I leave this slip, this slide, is like a box with puzzle pieces in it. No one wants a puzzle with missing pieces because it's too impossible to make sense of and put together. A puzzle's only fun and effective to play with if you have enough pieces to make something of it. And the code is puzzle pieces, and we divvy out these pieces across kindergarten, first grade, second grade, with the hope that by third, it's all put together and kids are ready to read to learn. But we do have to be mindful that developmental readiness makes that an impossibility, because kids are not all over the same places in kinder and first. So kids who miss the bus in one grade have to make up for that in the next grade, and that takes time. So we have a lot of kids that finish the race at the end of second, and they're missing years' worth of this code-based delivery. And then they hit third grade, and it's done, because now the assessments are all about what was the author's, you know, what was she inferring? What was the purpose? What was the um, consequence? What's the irony? Not what's this word? So those kids kind of work through with these gaping holes that, that carry on. Now, unlike the teachers who were stuck with this limited amount of 
of sound skills to use. This, I just want to show these because these are kind of interesting. This is TK, pre-K TK. She wrote a, My Vocation House. Now, she's not even in kindergarten, official, formal kindergarten yet. And she owned blocks that she could put into a little three-block tower. She knew sneaky why, that's how she got my. She put vok, she close as she could to vacation. She got vok a shin. She doesn't know the A-T-I-O-N pattern yet, so she just thought, well, that's okay, I have another way I can do it. So she used the blocks she had to make up for what she didn't, and she was able to build with those sounds the words she wanted to write. What's interesting is, if writing is a step above reading, so if she were just reading, this is a great x-ray to show what she's got under her belt, because everything she did is perfectly on point for reading. The A-Y does say A. The V are all appropriate sound symbol matches. The sh, so we can see these skills that she's got to bring to the table as a reader by x-raying what she did as a writer. And then she has house, huh, ow! Now how will she fine tune that O-W into an O-U? Text experience using this to actually read. And she can't turn it off. You can't turn it off either. Once you can read, you can read. So once you know O, U, and O, W, you say, ow, everywhere you see it, guess what you're doing? You're reading. So as she has more opportunities for text experience, which by the way, she'll start getting two years earlier because O, U, O, W isn't supposed to be taught till second grade on most programs, scope and sequence. So it's not an issue of, oh no, but she spelled it wrong. The goal is get her reading, get her reading, get her reading, get her reading, and whatever she puts here, is part of the arsenal she brings to the table as a reader. And the more tools you bring to the table, the more value you take away every single day from your program and every single day from reading and writing across the day. Kids who bring nothing to the table sit there and just look at the world passing them by and then they leave. And that's unfortunately the bulk of our kids in K-1 if we're not able to give them enough access to the code needed to read. So if we really want to amp up the instructional value of our, of our program, of our writing time, of our reading time, of our science, math, and social studies time, where text is everywhere, we want to milk that text for all it's worth, but kids have to be able to, to make sense of it. They need their glasses. They need a lens through which it can make sense. And in order to have that, they need access to more, sooner, earlier, faster. Now this is kindergarten, and I just have to show you this part down here, because. Vacation House is not going to be on your word wall, and normally that's all a pre-K kid or a kinder kid would have to find words to write, because all they know are, what, a letter each week, two letters each week. You're definitely not going to find this on your word wall either. Look at the last four sentences. The ghost almost kissed her, but the dad said, get your hands off of my wife. <laughs> that will not be on your word wall, and yet that's where he wanted to take his story. <laughs> And who'd have thought that he wants to go there? But he does. And whatever he wants to say as a writer, if he's got what he needs to say it, that keeps him writing. And writing is a great way to practice reading. And reading is a great way to practice writing. So the goal is that, that, neuro, you know, that it's neurobiologically possible to get kids to think deeply about things they don't care about. We want them engaged in doing something they really love, not just looking at the word wall trying to find some word up there to copy, to put down so you're happy and let them go to blocks. Like we really want them to craft these these stories they want to tell using the words they want to use. We want them to pick up a book or look at a billboard or a menu and, and make sense of the text that they're seeing or at least try to figure it out. Like these are the things that tempt them and that's what we want our day to do is tempt them with text. Um, this is the Matthew effect. It's just a snowballing principle. Think about the little kids writing that you just saw and imagine they keep doing that. They just keep doing that. And then they're in second grade when those skills are supposed to be introduced and their old hats at it. Imagine how big that snowball's gotten in terms of use. Um, imagine the, the, the frequency of use of, let's say, just the O-U-O-W from kindergarten to second grade. Like thousands and thousands and thousands of time, times do they get to read it. And maybe that's a new vocabulary opportunity or more comprehension. I mean, every, every time you engage with text, there are things to be, to be eaten from that text, to be enjoyed from that text. Um, as children increase the number of phonics skills they know, they also increase the number of opportunities to reinforce them. Best way to practice phonics is to read. <laughs> Best way to practice phonics is to write. Best way to practice reading is to write. Best way to practice writing is to read. It all kind of spirals together. What's the first thing that's gonna stop a reader? When they can't read a word. What's gonna be the reason they can't read the word? Because they don't have the phonics skills that are in the word. So, how would it make sense then to go at a snail's pace with phonics skill delivery when the only way to actually engage in reading and writing without just pure rote memorization is putting those blocks together? You have to have the blocks to build stuff with those blocks. That's why you know, the need for speed is just so great. And only by using neuroscience can we go fast. 
You cannot go fast with these asponic skills. It would be cruel and unusual punishment to kids because these skills, and you'll see why in a couple slides, but these skills are abstract. They're the opposite of the nature of the audience we're teaching to. But they don't have to stay like that. We just have to be creative with our chess opponent and dig into that neuroscience application. So we don't have to wait. We can go fast. This little girl is going to teach you about our controlled vowels, and she is in her first week of kindergarten. She, her mom was at a conference, and when she went home at the dinner table, she told her husband about one of the sessions, which was this one. I was doing it for the, it was a State Department session, um, or State Department conference, and it was mandated for schools that needed to make improvement. So her mom was just talking about what they did each day, and this was during the first week of kinder, first week of school, I'm sorry. She's in her first week of kinder, and she overheard it at the table, and her mom tweeted this and tagged me in it because they heard noise in the living room, and she was playing school with her little sister. So this is her version, totally her version, of, of but, it, but it's perfect. She gets to the same place. She just does it in her own way. Um, it's her version of this little phonics secret. And listen to what she says at the end because it shows you where this lives in her brain. And it's not in the higher level executive processing center. It's back here in this feeling-based affective network. Hi, kids. Do you want to know about the secrets about these? So E-R-I-R-U-R. When they get together, they hop in their cars, they drive crazy, and they say, arr, 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 arr. Yeah. So, what they do, drive in their cars crazy. But when you grow up, you don't do that. Okay? That's a public service announcement for safe driving. And that's part of what holds this skill in place. And, and you know what else helps hold the skill in place? Is the lectures that someone at her house has been receiving about safe driving. Because the only way she could know to tell you how to drive is if somebody in her family has told someone else in her family what they need to do when they're behind the wheel. All that works in our favor because this becomes the glue that this skill sticks to. Now this skill gets to live rent free on this connection that's already deeply entrenched in her understanding. And that the mnemonic, the embedded mnemonic picture is what will help her keep track of it. Because that's the one thing that could float away, because what's the new piece, what's the abstract piece, what's the unknown piece? The phonemic symbol. But everything else, she could just probably talk about for an hour if she wanted to, and with ease. So why would we wait to give this powerful building block of the code until second grade? Think how many words have the er sound. All those words end up on a word list. The kids have to go home and waste time memorizing, and you'll see why I say waste time, because there's absolutely no optimal brain circuitry occurring with rote word memorization. It's actually, in terms of the basis of what science of reading has come kind of from, looked at as a detriment. It's detrimental for kids to memorize more than they read, because it engages, um, hemi uh, it engages um, the right hemisphere, which is where weak readers show engagement, versus strong readers with active decoding on the left hemisphere. So the idea is we want to actively decode, not rote memorize, and if kids get confused about an approach with text, they don't always want to go and decode because they're used to memorizing more words than they decode. So they'll look at text and then look at you and wait for you to tell them the word. It doesn't occur to them to roll up their sleeves because they got this and they can just plow in there and figure it out. There's a, an attack plan that we want to foster or support with kids, which is when you see text, Plow into it, figure it out. You can do it. All those words over here, they started to get a little bit, I wouldn't say higher level, but again, all of these words that become bigger, um, all these multisyllabic words are made up of those same simple building blocks that we have in these little early grade words. Phonics does not have to be hard, we just make it hard. And oh my goodness, in the last couple of years, we've made it so, 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 so hard. It does not have to be hard. That's the understanding of the brain science. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be hard. Now, math does have to be hard. I am horrible at math. And if you have a way to make math not hard, please tell me. Because math, you can't cheat as easily as you can with these sound symbol connections. They lend themselves beautifully to these, to these backdoor channels. Alternatives to getting these are controlled vowels, or again, like I put this Asian sound over here just because of the slash and dash example up above. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with slashing and dashing. There are reasons, there are methods to the madness when you're going backward and reflecting on like spellings and root words and prefixes, kind of like diagramming sentences. It's like dissecting something to understand why it is what it is. But if you're a beginning learner looking at this from the bottom up, you just need to make sense of that word. 
You don't have the capacity to understand all the dynamics that go into something to even understand what the slashes and dashes are for. So it's all about kind of the perspective. Are the kids looking at it from the bottom up, like a doctor dissecting something to see what went wrong in a surgery? Or are they looking at it from the, from the bottom, did I say bottom up? I meant to say top down. Or are they looking at it from the bottom up, where they're just trying to make sense of what's in front of them? They don't even know what this is even about. What is reading? What are those squiggles? You've got to kind of keep track of what they have to work with, where that brain development leaves off. But these are some of the things you hear people say when we think of phonics. Too many rules, too many exceptions. It takes three grade level years to teach the whole code. Way too abstract, too hard, not child-centered, not developmentally appropriate, and certainly not any fun. And we hear that because at its face, phonics is abstract skill. It's, a, it's abstract academic skill set. It's not the food that we would normally feed concrete learners. But imagine that it's the first day of kindergarten, and imagine that you just sang an alphabet song, not the better alphabet song, a normal one. And in your song, you said A says A, 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 but it could also say A, 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 A. And now you have to come face to face with the word August. Beautiful example of a capital A up there. You really wish you could show how you can now take this capital A and apply what you just taught to figure out this word. But the problem is, this is going to do the opposite because we've got a beautiful capital A that looks just like the one on your alphabet train, but it's not going to do what you just told kids to do if they happen to see a capital A. It's going to say August. You're going to skip the U entirely and hope they just don't even notice that. <laughs> and then you're going to move on with your lesson and hope that they can just remember the words August. Well, that wasn't sucking the value out of that time that we were taking to look at the word August, let alone the rest of the calendar and all the words that are on it. What would be is if we tell them, oh, you know what, guys, there's a secret. I see a secret in this word, in this word August. That's why it, the word looks like it should be August, August, but it's not, it's August. Because your birthday is not August the 31st, right, Johnny? Okay, so yeah, so it's August. The reason that we couldn't read that word is because there's a secret in it. It's a grown up reading secret. Now, I've got to be careful because if I tell you one you're not ready for, your brain could explode and I don't want that to happen. So I have to make sure that you are really ready for it. Now, how do I know they're ready? Because they're looking at me like this. Why are they looking at me like they can't wait to hear what I'm about to say? It's not because I'm going to talk about an alternative sound for the letter A, because that wouldn't get them excited. It's because I said a magic word for kids, which is secret. Secrets, by default, are something you're not supposed to have. Anything that's scarce automatically has a need. So even for kids, you've got to think about, like, what would they hold precious? Now, secrets, these are good secrets. These are grown-up secrets that they're supposed to tell their parents. So they're not secrets they're not supposed to tell. They're just not supposed to tell other kids because other kids may not be ready. But I know you guys are ready because you're all looking at me like you can't wait to hear what I'm about to say. Now, what I'm doing here is priming them for learning. I'm trying to mark this information that's about to come for memory in the brain. I'm putting a little tag on it that says, this is important, keep it somewhere safe. And where it's going to live right now is in a temporary box called the secret I learned today. I don't know what it's for, and I don't know what to do with it, but whatever it is, it's a secret, and I know it. Like, that's it. They're just looking for this thing called a secret with no actual purpose or need to figure out the word August. Matter of fact, they've probably already forgotten about whatever the word was at this moment. So I've got them captivated only because I used that little magic word there. Now they're ready. There's a catcher's mitt in place. You never want to tell or teach something that nobody asks for, nobody wants, and nobody cares because you're just talking to yourself. You're just throwing a ball to an empty field. There's no catcher there. The catcher in place right now, he's a secret catcher. So all he's going to do is just going to catch the secret. Once he catches it, we're going to do stuff with it. But if he doesn't catch it, catch it there's nothing to do with it. So you want to put the catcher's mitt in place first by making sure that you've marked that information in a way that kids want to get it. Now you're ready to deliver it. And I'm going to show you this teacher who does it better than anyone because she, she does a beautiful job priming these kids for learning. You would never know a phonics skill is about to come. To fourth graders? To fourth graders? To both students. <gasps> oh, my. To third graders? Don't know the secrets. Don't know the secrets. What? what? The second graders don't know the secrets. Oh, my God! The first graders don't know the secrets. <laughs> Now that's not the worst show for the worst audience, that's the best show for the perfect audience. She's got them ready to go, and now she can tell them there are two letters, in love. I don't mean like a little in love, I mean these guys have a huge crush on each other. AU and 
A-W there in love too. And anytime they have to stand like right together in a word side by side, they get so embarrassed that they always put their heads down and they say, ah, and that's the sound they make. And it's not just in the word August, but look at your name, Austin. Look at this word over here, saw. Look, we're gonna have spaghetti sauce at lunch. Now, if you're in an upper grade, could your kids read the word hydraulic? because they need to know about sneaky Y and the two letters that are in love in that word. Much harder word than August, and yet a word very possibly could come up in science class. What about the word dawdle in third grade vocabulary? There are so many opportunities to build with these blocks. We're just, at each grade level, building a different level structure. But in fourth or fifth grade, if a kid can't read the word, you can't just tell them the word. Like, what do you do? when If you want to talk to your upper grade teachers and see if they are struggling, just say, what do you do when a kid can't read a word? Nine times out of 10, they'll say, well, just tell them the word. But that's a lot of kids and a lot of words, and that doesn't plug the hole. The goal is to give kids a bucket of snacks they help themselves, a way that they can do it on their own, and you're just facilitating the process of access to get the sounds they need for reading and the spellings they need for writing. Um, and the beauty of this is, you, you know, the phonics code only has so many blocks. So when you play with those blocks, you can build anything. Now, when I was in a PD, I had third through fifth grade teachers, and one of the teacher's daughters was um, in the audience, and when I was doing that secret and I went, ah, it was the only time she looked up. And she looked up kind of looking at me like I was going to fall over or like I'd had a stroke or something weird had happened because I just made this weird sound. I shifted my body to the right. I'm wiggling. So I was doing these things that were, was getting her attention, and the whole time she was looking at me, she had a need to know, but it wasn't how to read the word August. It's what's wrong with this woman? Why is she doing this? Why is she making that weird sound? Why is she twisting to the left? But that gave me about six seconds of her attention and her focus. And then she went back to playing on her mom's phone. The neat part is we did a little experiment after the break. I went up to her and I held up the picture and I said, could you tell me what these letters say? Now keep in mind, she paid no attention to the point up to me looking weird. And she just went, she did exactly what I did. She went, ah. Now, she wasn't thinking about lip position, tongue position, mouth shape. She wasn't thinking about phonics at all. It was just a way to pull a sound from a symbol because of a connection that was known or already familiar. You could be a fourth grade teacher and work every day to try to pull a phonics sound from a pattern and have kids just not know what it is, not know what it is. To have the ability to trigger it easily and give them a way to do it independently, that's where you can really start playing and start building that ownership and applying it to words. She wasn't ready to use it to read, by the way. But you know what, if she were in my class, whether she was ready or not, we're gonna see the word saw. We're gonna see the word August for the next 30 days. We're gonna see the word spaghetti sauce on the lunchroom menu. So whether she's ready or not to use it, we're using it. Like, and I don't mean the skill, I mean the words. Text is everywhere. We work with it. That's what we do in kindergarten and pre-K even. You're working with text. So the buffet is the skill access. They can help themselves. It's not being pushed on them. There's no expectation with a secret or a story. It's just there for the taking for kids who are ready to apply it to the stuff you're already doing. And that's the biggest point I really want to make is this is stuff we're already doing. We're already looking at words all day long. The question is, what do we get out of that deal? Do we get anything out of that? Or is it just crowd control while we get through this and get through that? There's, go there's gold to be harvested in every interaction with text if you have something to harvest it with. You have to have something familiar within that text that you can see and start to play with and make sense of. The way that this works in the brain is brain develops earlier, developing areas back to front, social, emotional, feeling-based networks are in the mid-rear part. The higher level executive processing centers aren't even formed at the time that these earlier developing centers are on board and functioning quite well. It's how your toddlers misbehave so beautifully and know how to stop doing that when you turn around. Like they're very adept with these behavioral and feeling-based connections, and it's also something we all share as humans. Um, we have very similar reactions, responses. We navigate our behavior in similar ways. I mean, not completely similar, but we know how we should be navigating our behavior. Um, higher level executive processing depends on a lot, depends on a lot of variables we can't control. Um, a lot of things that we can't know we're taught or that we can't know are understood. So but what we're trying to do is engage these earlier developing centers, and by cloaking these phonic skills as feeling-based behaviors, we engage these areas that respond to that stimulus, and those are these earlier developing centers. So we know that's the area we want to target. We just have to then deliver that skill content wrapped up in this familiar disguise, as opposed to this is a digraph, this is a trigraph, this is a fricative and an a fricative, this is a slide and a glide. You know, those are abstract on abstract. 
because now you've got the abstract symbol and you're giving that abstract symbol an abstract term. There are even liquids, by the way, when it comes to different sound variations, but liquid has its own meaning and the liquid is actually, it doesn't mean it's, it's liquid, it refers to the sound and it applies to another abstract symbol and all of these things can just put you generations away from get and reading. So you really have to kind of know like what, why am I doing what I'm doing, what is it for, who is it going to and is it gonna get me there? And if there isn't get and reading, then I wouldn't do that at the beginning grade levels because the goal above everything else is to get them reading. These are the areas of difficulty that many kids would have with reading and they are not part of the, they are not landmines when you're coming through the back door. Developmental readiness is not an issue when you're coming through the back door in terms of giving access. Now, when it transfers for use, that's gonna be different for every learner. Not every learner is gonna pick up that piece and start using it to read and to write. That variation is gonna, it's gonna go across a bell curve. Some kids will instantly get what this is for and start using it. Other kids will just relish talking about the sounds, making the sounds, looking at the pictures, telling the stories, and that's okay. That's incubating. That means they needed it earlier even more. So it's not a high kid thing. The kids who struggle the most are the kids who need more time to really take this in, not have it all thrown at them at the last minute because they're behind anyway and now we're in second grade and you're barely up to first grade level and you gotta learn these skills so I'm gonna have you skip recess and go out with Mrs. Johnson. Like they can start chewing on this so much earlier and in a totally child-centered play-based way. And they're the ones who need to do that more than the high kids. High kids will figure it out. It's great to give them something like a buffet where they can eat more, do more, have more sooner, but it's the kids who struggle, who don't have parent support, who don't have language support. Those are the kids it's most important for because we don't wanna hit these landmines with kids who inherently are gonna have those issues. We need to bypass those, those spots. Now, I'm not gonna get into this too much, but this is just another example of how to pull things into this backdoor realm. Familiar templates, everybody knows about superheroes and the markers. They have a special power, they have to have a disguise, there's always a villain, like Lex Luthor. Superhero vows fall exactly neatly into the same bucket. They have superpowers, they can say their name when no other letters can. They have a disguise, which are, they wear these little short and lazy disguises so no one can see them. Like you pretends in the classroom he's not paying attention, so nobody thinks he's a superhero. And anytime the teacher calls on him, he'll go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh and that's his disguise. Now it's also the schwa sound. It's also the short U sound. So it's really an easy way to connect a sound that has no lip position and no tongue position and give it a hook. So what does you say? Ah, uh, and that's the sound. Instead of kids trying to figure out where to put their tongue or how not to head to an eh, I mean, it can get really mushy in there. So we want clear hooks to hang their hats on that are connected to something that isn't related to how well they can hear the sound. So each of the disguises connects back to something they already know that causes the sound to pop out of their mouth and doesn't require them to fiddle with it, which is important because the vowel sounds can be really difficult for kids who struggle for reading, for language, for speech, or tick, but they are actually the most important thing and we, not, we want them fast and easy. When they use their superhero powers, they're gonna say their name and sneaky Y is Lex Luthor of the alphabet. He's not up here, but he is coming up. So this just goes to show something that is going back to my point about your scope and sequence and how things can live together beautifully. Um, April 19th, this teacher was saying that, she said, we had a few superheroes pay us a visit this week. We already knew the vowel secrets. We've known they had more than one sound since the first week of school, so we didn't have to wait until this week in our phonics program to find out, but it was a fun review. Imagine waiting until April 19th when, to do something that your kids have been doing since the first week of school. Think how every word has a vowel. There's no such thing as a word without a vowel they effectively would have not been able to read any words where the vowel made any sound other than a short sound for the whole year, as opposed to having access to both sounds. And the reason the program didn't want to introduce the second sound is because it wasn't going to introduce silent E until first grade. And that's the reason that it didn't want to confuse the waters by saying, hey, it could make two sounds, because then a kid's going to go, well, how do I know? Which one? And they weren't going to say that yet. This is, what is the third week of kindergarten? Um, I don't know if it's in that, yeah, third week of kindergarten. He's gonna explain how he knows whether vowels long or short, but listen to what he says at the end and you can see it lives in his brain in the same place as the other little girl with the cars. So, when mommy E tells the I to say his name and like, so it says, la, like, like. It says it's, I says its name, 
Like he's supposed to. Like he's supposed to. That's not optional. That's not a phonics skill he memorized. That's just what you do when your mama tells you to do something. Now, it may not be a pretty little e that's at the end of that word, though, because in a multisyllabic word, even in a simple word like making, how do you know it's not macking? What do you do if there's no e? How do you know which way the vowel's going to go? Well, traditional front door would be, well, when you have a vowel consonant consonant vowel pattern, you divide after, you divide between the two consonants, in which case you have a closed syllable, and that then would dictate that the vowel would be short. However, if you have a vowel consonant vowel pattern, you'll divide after the vowel, in which case you have what we call an open syllable, thereby dictating that that vowel will be long. I hope this trick will help you make your way through the word list on page 14. That's not going to make sense to a kindergartner. We have fourth graders who struggle with that. This is so easy. When mom's got to get out of the house, she puts a babysitter in charge. So guys, if you see any vowel that's one letter away from another vowel, that's the babysitter. It's doing exactly what mom would if she were there. It's telling the vowel it's one letter away. You say your name. And you're going to listen to me, because just like you listen to your mom, you're going to listen to me too. So a word like making, or hibernate, or um, biking. Anytime you have a vowel one letter away from another vowel, it's the babysitter vowel It's going to do what mom would. It's going to tell that vowel to say its name. So it's super easy. Now, if a word's like bitter, that, 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 the word like bitter where mom is two letters away, or if you have another vowel that's two letters away, they're too far away to get a hold of them and make them do it. So that's why the vowel gets to be short and lazy. Like, mommy, E could tell that I to say his name in the word bitter, but bottom line is her little arms aren't long enough to reach overhead, so he gets to do whatever he wants. But if it's one letter away, bitter turns into biter pretty darn fast. So it's just like kids. They listen to mom when she's close enough to get them. But when she's not, well, sometimes they don't as well as they should. So this gives kids a way, a compass, to know which way to go. I'm just going to let you watch an ELL learner do it. Then I have one more slide, and then I'm going to let this wrap, because there's a couple really cool things I want to show you at the end here. Um, Abel, this, a teacher sent this to me. A little guy named Abel entered Kinder, knew seven letters, no sounds. Uh, thanks better alphabet, got them by October. She said, I sat down with him and asked him to read to me. He pulled out Arthur's Halloween, and I said, oh, this looks like a great picture to read. Can you tell me a story to go with it? Because she didn't think he could read it. And he looked at her weird, and then he started reading. And she was so surprised by this and stunned that she videotaped it. And you can hear her asking, how did you know this? How did you know that? Because this is part of that incubation. She laid things out. She made things make sense. She used opportunities in the class to show how this works with kids who were ready. She just didn't think he was one of them. But he was watching. He was listening. And when she wasn't looking, he went up to that buffet, and he tasted everything. And she didn't even know he was ready. For, she thought he just wanted his peanut butter. So she was laying out those other things for kids who were ready for it. But we don't, we don't know what's going on inside of kids' heads. And a lot of kids are ready for a lot more. They just don't have the basis if it's all coming through the front door. They don't have the language background. They don't have the parents to help practice the sight words. But they're smart. They're clever. They just need a foothold to make sense of it. So I'm going to play this. This is him using babysitter vowels and mommy E and other stuff kind of thrown in. But I love the question and answering. Here. It's really fast. Hmm. Hmm. What do you need to do there? Is there a secret in that word? What is that I doing in that word? Into that A. A. What does he tell that A to do? That's right. So try it again. A. B. Making. Right. The. How. Luke. Good job. Now, real quick about that, you saw him go, house? He was, he never looked at her, he never asked her a question, he never asked for the word. He took every word one at a time and he played with it and figured it out. And look and spooky has O O, but it makes two different sounds, and he had to flip from O to U uh for look to spooky. But I love the, the, the slow, intentional attack. Like, I really loved that he didn't, he didn't expect to see the word and know it. And he wasn't just reading in his sleep. Like, he wasn't just spouting off words he'd seen before and memorized. He expected to have to work for it. This says hibernate. Hibernate. How do you know that says hibernate? Why does it say I? Because the mama E. The mama E. And what do these two say? Uh, what is that A getting to say its name? Right. Now look at down here. What's what happening with this word? Hibernating. Hibernated. Remember? It sounds like hibernated. 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 Yeah, because it's a little different. Good job. So just that logical talk, just that ability to look at a word and then make sense of it. How do you know this? Well, how would we know that? How did we know to make this sound and not that sound? That's so important. 
because your alternative is you're an actor, this is a script, memorize your lines, come back here, meet me at this table, we'll put on our show tomorrow. Like that's how it used to feel to me teaching K-1 when the only way we could read the words were to memorize what the words were and it just, it's not reading, that's, that's not helpful. So this is Lex Luthor, sneaky why. I'm not gonna explain it again because I already explained it once but anytime he is at the beginning of a line he does just what he should, beginning of a word, makes the sound he's supposed to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime is the end or in the middle, like in a word like systematic or symphony. Um, granted, it's his short sound, but would you put it past Lex Luthor to impersonate Clark Kent also? Like we know he'd impersonate Superman if he could. Couldn't you see him putting on some glasses and pretending to be Clark Kent too? Like it's just really interesting when you start patterning out this logical line of, of most likely, next most likely, if all else fails, I bet this is what's going on. It opens up this whole other realm of cognitive flexibility that is the key to making sense of things when they don't go perfectly right. It's the same kind of thinking doctors apply, this diagnostic thinking, this critical thinking playground where everything doesn't have to be an exception. It can just be the next most likely thing to try for that word, and it makes it easy. Like, mom, like babysitter vowels, the word have should behave. It's not, what else do you know? What else can you try? What else could A say? Well, it could say eh, right, try that, have, poof, we're done, we got the word. It doesn't have to go into this realm of, oh, okay, it's an exception, I don't know anything to do with that, I can't figure it out. Yeah, that's just a, it's a playground for figuring out. That's the fun part. So having the best betting odds for Las Vegas by making things more predictable, by aligning it to behavior we understand is where kids get a leg up on words they've never seen before and they're trying to attack text with. This is uh, Fonzie, he's just gonna make sure you understand this E-Y, A-Y sound. A-Y and E-Y. These letters are just too cool. So with thumbs up and their coolest voices, they say, Hey. Hey. Now there are your best betting odds for Las Vegas. So you've got all these different possibilities for the why. I didn't even show you the OI, OI, but these are the things that we want kids armed when they come to the table. This is a real, to a real post that I saw online. We had a particularly interesting discussion about the why in Riley and Kate, yeah name. Riley is represented with the IPAA, while two symbols represent one letter. This is first grade, by the way. We pronounce these symbols and realize in vocalizing that letter that our mouth begins in one position but ends in another. It's not a huge difference, but we all notice that our mouths closed a bit toward the end of pronunciation. I told them they had just experienced a vowel glide. We were gliding from one IPA symbol to another as we pronounced the Y in Riley's name. We compared that to the Y in Katya's name, which was represented by the IPA symbol of J. One letter, yet two very different pronunciations. And then there were these things on the top of everybody's name tag that was their name in IPA lettering. So this is how far off the get them reading track we can find ourselves on if we're not mindful of what am I, why am I doing what I'm doing? And is it gonna get me where I'm trying to go? Now this is my last slide before I want Rachel to come up, but the bottom line is we wanna teach the reader, not the reading. That she is gonna talk just for about five minutes on what I found just, it was, it shifted everything that I really understood about studies, research, and what the evidence is, what we're looking at evidence for, what the purpose of these studies that we see and that we're trying to make sense of as teachers are. This is a Stanford study, and it, it was one of the, it was kind of a, I think a genesis of the science of reading movement because it was one of the first studies that showed that when kids memorize and don't read words, there's no brain circuitry that's advantageous, that the active decoding is what, is what triggers the engagement that skilled readers show when we look at things and we backward map their progress. We see in dyslexic upper grade readers engagement on the right hemisphere, which is the area that engages when kids are rote word calling. So if we teach them to read wrong by memorizing more than they read, we're actually training the brain to look at words and memorize them. We're training the brain to process text on the right hemisphere. And that's the absolute opposite of what we want in terms of optimal brain engagement. So this was really part of the, the push start of science of reading. So it's one study that's gonna kind of lead us into some things that Rachel's gonna share in the next five minutes. So Rachel Schechter, please take it away. Thank Here you. you go, you're gonna need this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for having me. Um, so Katie, so I'm, I run a company, I started a research firm called Learning Experience Design Research, LXD Research. And I started my, um, I was an intern actually, when I first started becoming a researcher. And um, Dora the Explorer, I got a chance to work on the first and second season. So I got to see firsthand how using research could both inform design 
and make sure that students' learning outcomes were being hit. And how many of you have heard of Dora the Explorer? <laughs> right, so it became a worldwide phenomenon because we were so intent on making sure that the design and the outcomes were being met. So Dora was an explorer. Katie's been talking about kids being detectives. And researchers are investigators. And through these investigations, we're looking to see are teachers using the right strategies at the right time to teach what they're trying to teach, and is it working? So it seems really straightforward, but research contexts are complicated, and learning experiences have a lot of context and are different kinds of dynamics. So it's really important that we think about research. We understand that research is actually an umbrella term. It's not a dichotomous thing where does this have research or is this based on research or is this not based on research? There are all different kinds of settings and um, in the ways that we investigate in different contexts that researchers kind of bring to the table. And you're all researchers too. You're looking to see what is working, which strategies are making your students hit the goals that they have. So we know that the Department of Education has provided some guidance to um, evaluate research and to help us all have kind of that same framework and looking at research studies, of which there are many studies um, and we're all trying to make sense of them. But I want you to know that there's maybe a secret out there that most studies are actually not eligible to be reviewed by the What Works Clearinghouse. In fact, over 99% of product research is not reviewed by experts. So I'm one of the folks that's coming in and stepping in and trying to help educators like yourselves understand like, what is this research and what is it saying. So we look at both the design and the impact of strategies and practices to see how it's helping you meet your goals with students. And what I want you to know about all these levels is that the levels are about the design of the study, not the impact of the study. In order to understand the impact of a study, we really have to delve a little deeper and check out those details on what happened. What was the beginning and after story of the research and that investigation? And that's in the research paper. And I want to let you know that, again, the design is not about the impact. Even the Evidence for ESSA website has studies, and you might see this Evidence for ESSA symbol on a product, for example, on their website, but they're actually might have proven, their investigation might have proven that they actually have no impact on student learning. So you see that zero? That zero means that this product proved it had zero impact on learning. So this is kind of like the secret, actually, that the just because you have a research study doesn't mean that the product actually helped children learn. What statistics tells us is, is it more than chance? Is it actually from that program, the strategies used in the program, that led to this impact? And, that's, and we have something, a number called an effect size. And an effect size helps us look across the studies to see, well, what is the magnitude of the effect of this research study? What did we find in this before and after, or comparing students who use the program to students who did not use the program? And I've looked at the strategies used by Katie, who she talked about it today, and what I want you to understand too is when you go out and talk to the exhibitors about different studies and different strategies and programs, is that it's not a one and done. Research is not a one and done experience. It has to be done over and over and over again for us to be able to see this. So we looked with a partner, I looked at, at the strategies that, that um, Katie mentioned, 28 different studies. And even though some might have only had one or uh, just a few classrooms, together it was an expansive investigation with over 800 students, over 30 teachers, multiple grade ranges, ranges and, and this context, it's, it's, you know, if I just heard one of these stories, I probably would have thought it wasn't true. <laughs> I would have been like, oh, this is an anomaly. There's no way this could be true. It happened for my students. But we heard that over and over again with all different assessments used, um, and that's why we gave um, recognition for ESSA Level 1 evidence for this program, that was for the strategies talked about uh, today. And what is the design? This design is really talking about who was in the study. So a Level 1 study looks at a group that used the program and didn't use the program randomly assigned for strong and just maybe volunteered or assigned for moderate. 
Promising study may actually have no students that didn't use the program. It's really this before and after story, who used the program more versus who used the program not as much. And then a level four is just the idea that this program should work using academic research. So when you go out there, so I've heard from the exhibitors that the teachers are not asking them for the research studies. So I encourage you, ask them for the research. Say, what studies do you have? How many studies have you done? Where can I find them online? And if you get overwhelmed once you have those studies in hand, please check out our evidence checklist where we can kind of like walk through some of the basic qualities of the study so you can help evaluate these research papers that now almost all companies have. Thank you. I also have articles uh, for educators that can ho hopefully help kind of navigate this crazy time. Um, so thank you again so much for listening. And you can find us at www.lxdresearch.com for, for all these articles about research and how to evaluate research papers. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. I wanted Rachel to share because it really helped me a lot. It blew my mind that you could see studies that were high highly regarded studies, but if you really look at the details, their effect size was zero. Like they just, but it was about the design and just understanding the frameworks of these studies and thinking of it as an investigation like we would do in our class every day to see what works, what doesn't, and we find our way, but this has been done for us if we're looking at the proper things and in the right ways. So I wanted to thank Rachel, she's, she's really amazing. So anyway, thank you so much as well. If you have any questions at all, please just feel free to meet me out there. Rachel and I both are going to be out at the author's table. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Get in the Facebook group, call me out, tag me, ask me anything. Heck, ask everybody in there everything, because they know more than I do, because they do this in every which way you could imagine. And um, I just hope that, I, I appreciate that you stayed. I hope that I didn't keep you too long for lunch. So thank you so much. <laughs>